going to call this meeting of the Galeford Gilmington Joint School Board to order. Did I get a specific get a posting? Yes, uh, the meeting was posted online on the school district website as well as in the schools. Next, I'd ask everyone to stand for the pledge. Uh -huh. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up is the approval of minutes from our last joint meeting with the Gilmington School Board on October 5th. All motions to approve the joint meeting from October 5th of 2020. All second. Seconded by Adam. Any discussion? All in favor? Signify by raising your hands. I can see. It looks like it's unanimous. Next up is the first of two public comments. Um, if you'd like to speak, please state your name, approach one of the microphones, please state your name and address. Um, this agenda item is intended to give Gilmington and Guilford citizens a voice uh, and the Guilford School District an opportunity to hear from you all directly. Uh, please note this, is this time is not intended for question and answer. Um, questions about programs and otherwise can be directed to um, respective administrators during the day. But please approach the microphone if you have a comment. Good evening, school board members. My name is Dr. David Strang. Before I get started, I'd like to ask why is our flag? in the corner, in the shadows, when people cannot even see it. I think it's unconscionable that the symbol of our country, a beacon of freedom throughout the world, is in the corner, in the shadows, where it cannot be seen. I hope that you change that in future meetings. My name is Dr. David Strang. I live on Cop Road in Gilmanton. I'm a 1986 graduate of Dartmouth Medical School. I've been practicing medicine for 32 years. I've chaired numerous state boards and committees, often serving uh, as the chair in the process. I'm here to tell you today that masks do not work to stop the transmission of COVID or any other virus for that matter. There is no study that shows that that is the case. When I was a resident, we were rounding on an inpatient who had been admitted to the hospital with tuberculosis. And before we went into that room, which was exhausted to the outside, much like a room housing a COVID patient would, had ultraviolet lights on the wall to kill any germs floating in the air. Before we went in, being dutiful residents, we started putting our face masks on, exactly the same types of masks that you are wearing today. And the attending physician, the pulmonologist, looked at us with derision and said, what are you doing? And we said, putting our masks on. And he said, why? And he said, so we don't get tuberculosis. He said, are you kidding me? Do you think that that mask, that little mask, is gonna stop you from getting tuberculosis? If it's floating around the room, this thing is not duct taped to your face. You are not hermetically sealed against the environment. It's gonna go right around the corner of your mask, into your mouth, and you're gonna get TB. If you wanna use a mask to stop getting from getting TB, put the mask on the patient. In other words, quarantine the sick, not the well. There is no study that, that today shows that you will stop the transmission of COVID or any other virus with a mask. Please consider that when you adopt your policies. And finally, please stop using the horrendous term social distancing. There is nothing social about keeping human beings apart. If you must use something, please use the term physical distancing. Thank you. Jade Wood, Chestnut Drive, Guilford. Um, here I have a petition demanding an end to masking in Guilford's in schools. 
to SAU 73 School Board. Whereas I, the undersigned, understand that multiple research reports dating back to June 2020 have demonstrated that children are not affected statistically by COVID-19. They rarely contract the disease, rarely get severely ill if they do, and rarely pass the disease to others. Whereas I believe that requiring our children to wear face coverings all day in the classroom has negative health effects on children, including decreased oxygen intake, decreased carbon dioxide elimination, and increased introduction of viruses and bacteria into the lungs, in addition to severe negative social mental trauma that may affect our children for decades. And whereas I understand that decades of peer-reviewed science demonstrates that masks don't work and have never worked, to prevent the spread of respiratory virus. And finally, I understand that other countries and states who did not close schools and force masking upon children have had no worse outcomes by any measurable statistics than areas that forced draconian health measures. And therefore, I undersigned, and I will produce multiple copies of this as we already have, since going live for just 24 hours, over 120 signers, I, Jade Wood, demand for my children and yours that SAU 73 School Board end the anti-science child masking policies in all Guilford facilities. And I have a copy for each of you, and I'll be providing more signed copies tomorrow at the office. Thank you. I hope you don't think I'm being reckless by passing out paper in front of you, but thank you for those. My name is Kristen Markle, 26 Millwood Drive. First, I would like to congratulate and thank the school board, superintendent, principals, teacher, and staff for all that you have done this year to keep our children in school full time and the countless hours that you all put in to contact tracing, phone calls, emails, and safety measures. We are an anomaly in our small town of Guilford and we have proved there is a way to give the children of this district what they deserve, full in-time learning in a school environment with their friends and teachers. It is time now, though, to push once more to unmask our children in schools. As we have seen, the cases and hospitalizations are at an all-time low. Every person over 12 years old has been given the opportunity to be vaccinated. Nearly every other establishment has dropped the mask mandate, including restaurants, bars, box stores, libraries, and supermarkets. Our children can go anywhere they wish without a mask, yet they still have to wear them in school. What common sense does that make? What are we doing to these children? And more importantly, what are we waiting for? What other box has to be checked to finally say, no more masks in school? We have abided by the mask mandate for over a year now, and our freedom of choice is being impeded on. We as parents have the right to decide what is best for our own children. Please give us back the power as parents to decide. We are doing a real disservice to our children. We are covering their noses and mouths where they breathe. We are making them fearful of a virus that has never affected children the way it does adults. The weather last week and these last few days have been brutally hot, and there is no air conditioning in the Guilford Elementary School, yet we continue to make the children suffer. I personally have called my daughter out of school three times now for her safety in these extreme temperatures. Please consider dropping the mask mandate tonight and putting the decision back in the hands of the parents where it belongs. Let's go out on a high note here, Gilbert, and prove again that we are leaders and we are proactive in protecting our freedoms as well as our children. Thank you. Thank you.
as he would from 193 Cuts Night Drive in Guilford. Um, I don't have a lot prepared, but I have a severely asthmatic daughter, and to the point where, so for everyone to understand, um, to do the golf, the Guilford gauntlet this past week, she had to have someone run with her just to be sure. Um, so it's a pretty severe case. And I know you give the option to have the children at home, but let's be honest, we went through everything we did from March to what, June last year, and it didn't work for our children. It didn't work for several parents. So we chose to go along and with the mask because that was the best for her education. But now over time, we have learned a lot more about the virus in the mask and to what the last person had said, we can go anywhere we want. I haven't worn, I, I think, once put on five inches of the bed in the last three weeks. I've had no reason to wear a mask. I've gone out, no one's made me wear a mask. I haven't got COVID. Not that I'm an at risk um, age group, but nor is my child. So now with the temperature being 90 degrees and it's, it's above 90 degrees, we now have to decide are we going to send our children to school and make them suffer? I mean, I will wear a mask for a half hour when I start touching it. At that point, I think, so I know little kids are touching their mask throughout the day. It's uncomfortable. And then they add the heat to it. That's just absurd. So they're touching it. So if it's for the safety protocol of we're trying to keep the virus away from the children, well, then they're touching their mask. And we have them playing sports inside. They're going to the gym. My daughter was going to do a camp this, this week in the, here in the high school, but she had to wear a mask inside. And this is just getting to the point where, when do we stop and use common sense? I think a lot of us, not everyone's wearing a mask that's through here. Um, we go everywhere and we see each other without masks. And for the school to not be on board with that, it doesn't make any, it doesn't, to me, it just doesn't seem, it just, one of the two doesn't add up. I think we use common sense and we think about it. There's no real reason to keep wearing masks. So I'm asking that you guys remove the mask mandate. Uh, Manchester did today, for those that aren't aware, Manchester removed the mask mandate. Um, and I, I just think it's the logical thing to do at this point. We're past that. All this, we're moving forward. Um, so that's all I have to say, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Skip Shea, because that's what Superintendent Bikewood, uh Beitler called me in uh, response to my right to know request. Today I am Mr. Shea. Um, I had asked a question of the board when I sent in my last right to know, which I'm going to answer for you because nobody asked me that. And this has to do with an incident that happened a couple of years ago during my last year on the budget committee. And we were doing the administrative subcommittee, uh, myself and the chair and Eddie, who was the liaison from Budget uh, from the uh, selectmen. And Steve Tucker, at the time the curriculum director, was proposing a new fifth grade uh, math uh, program. And I immediately started to say, well, how are you going to know which program is better, the current one or this new one? How are you going to set up your experimental group versus your control group? What are the metrics for the current program against, against which you will be measuring? And what are you going to set up for metrics for the new one so that you will know uh, which one is better? Mr. Tucker at the time had no answer whatsoever. He was rather flustered, rather surprised at what Chan and I, being engineers, uh, are quite used to this kind of uh, talk. He said nothing. And then finally, Superintendent Beitler said, and this really astonished me, and I just couldn't believe it, he said, we will know that the new math program for the fifth grade will be a success because in seven years, we will have higher graduation rates. I was literally gobsmacked at that, that a superintendent earning the salary and benefits that he is right now would put out such a lackluster um, and rather oafish uh, response to what I thought was a rather valid question. Um, since this is not the public time for questions, I will withhold my questions until the second one. Would I be able to ask questions at that point? Public comment is just that, not for Q&A. So you are returning back to the, the years ago policy of the school board by which people like I who do not have kids in the school 
had no recourse to my elected representatives in order to seek redress. Is that true? Because I can't go to a teacher, I can't go to a vice principal, or a principal, assistant superintendent, or a superintendent. You folks are my only source of seeking redress, and now you've just said, I can't. I think you've um, followed the direct policy by uh, filing some right to know requests recently, um, and I'm confident that we've been responsive to those right to know requests. Um, no, the superintendent has done nothing. He sent me, I asked specific questions. He sent me two documents of which none of them, of the 90 odd pages plus, answered a single one of my questions. This is worthless. So where do I go? I even asked you, is this the, the workmanship that the school board wishes to be known for? And I didn't get a response from any of you. So I'm stuck here standing with no way of getting answers to my questions because you're shuffling that responsibility off to the superintendent and he's just blowing me off, which is not the first time. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I bet you're not. Any other comments? Uh, if I may, Gretchen, real quick, I just, I'm curious too, so this isn't a Q&A. Like he's saying, wh when, when does the public have the opportunity to come to their elected officials as a board, right, not as an individual? If it's not this meeting, then when is it? This was several years ago. It's recorded, and it's up on YouTube. And I was astonished that elected representatives decided to segregate themselves from the public. So as Mr. Sanborn is saying, those of us who are not in the school system, but we are taxpayers, we have no redress. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so again, just to finish, um, I feel, you know, I don't want to be here any later than anybody else does, right? I know sometimes these public comment sections can, can really persist and go on for hours, right? We've been here until midnight before. And I'm not saying we've got to get into, you know, drill down into the nitty gritty details, but some sort of question, and maybe outside of, I'm hearing a little feedback, um, just in general, you know, it's put out to the public that it's not a Q&A, so a lot of people don't feel like they can come here with questions, you know, general questions that they want to ask their elected representatives. So I don't see it as a problem if, you know, again, we're not gonna get it, if it's gonna turn into a back and forth where it's gonna take too much time, then we can follow up and maybe set up a meeting. But for somebody in the public, they should have complete access to be able to come and ask any questions of us. And that's that's where I'm at. So I don't, sounds like maybe you got something. Like you know, the thing we can have to remember though, Kyle, is that there's five of us up here and you're answering for all of us together. So if we have our email addresses out there, so that way those can be sent to us. We do sometimes direct, um, especially if it's an administration thing, for an administrator to answer those questions. 
outcomes, and you can easily have a need to go over every single question that's being asked of us. Um, but you do have to remember that, yes, they can ask you a question off to the side, or this is truly not intended for the question being answered to answer those things because you do sometimes have to do the research that goes along with it. And one person answering is answering for the entire board. 100% agree that one person shouldn't answer for the entire board. I'm not saying that if we're proposed a question that I'll be, okay, I need to go research this question. We need to be able to gather the data and figure out well, what our response is gonna be. But I think just to say to the general public that, hey, this isn't a Q&A, I think sends the wrong message. And I think we should be saying, hey, listen, if you have questions, bring them to the school board meeting. You may not get them answered tonight, but at least feel comfortable enough to come and have access to us. Because really outside of this meeting, yeah, we individually can, but this is the time when we are the board, when we are as one, and not that we're gonna give off individual answers to somebody, but at least it's, it's, it's the redress. It's the ability for them to have access to it. So again, I'm not trying to say that this should turn into you know, answering every little detailed question that anybody off the street wants to ask, but I do think it should be something that we at least make ourselves available to. That's, that's really all I'm saying. So. And the point I was making is, in my five years now on the board, um, I, this is the first time I've been accused of not getting questions answered. So, and, 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 that's, and I'll follow up, and, I, and I'll agree um, that it's, you know, you go past, it's maybe it's been five, six years, the previous board, and, you know, not throwing out names, but there was a, um, a sense that you could not approach the board. And there were meetings that I was present at that people were shouted down and basically told to go away. And I agree, this board, I, don't, I haven't seen it in my short tenure here. It seems like we have definitely allowed people to come up and speak for as much as they want, really. I mean, we really haven't put any time limits on anybody. And I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page on that, that technically, okay, maybe it's not you know, a Q&A where we're going to give you your answer that night, but certainly you know, don't feel like you can't come to us and ask these questions. I just wanted to kind of clarify that, that's all. And we need to look at all the facts and our experiences here in our district 
in our community and really do the right thing by our children. Um, with that said, there should be no reason why we cannot move forward with the community and let families decide when and if it's appropriate for our children to wear masks. There are no mandated masks in public now. It's optional. Our children are out there on masks because it's not mandated. And this is a public school district. Therefore, the mandate should be removed and masks should be optional. Regarding quarantine, I would really like the school board to look at our numbers for quarantine. How many positive cases have been transferred in the classroom? If this is a small percentage of individuals, I'm asking that we immediately stop following the guidelines. Let us make a more educated decision based on our experience here in Guilford. Eliminate the close contact quarantine altogether and start treating this like we do any cold, flu, or a case of strep throat, which somehow my kids actually got this year, but they never got COVID, so I'm not sure how that works. But with an amazing job the school nurses have done in collaboration with our parents, keeping kids home when feeling ill, there's no reason we cannot head in this direction. Um, so tonight with the school board, regardless of how you feel individually about the mask mandate, this is a choice that should be given to us parents, the parents that you all represent. We know better than anyone what is best for our children. And please consider taking this action now as well as changing the policy in quarantine. These policies no longer make sense and are no longer in our children's best interest. The scales have shifted in a more positive direction and it's time to join them. Subsidize the poor, but not the rich. 
I go back to volume 55 of the New Hampshire reports, page 503 and 505, 1875. It's the Brentwood School District case number two. This was in the old days where they said, uh, if the poor man or poor child behaves himself honestly and uprightly, the state owes him the services of the schoolmaster and charges the property of its more favored children in order to pay the debt, which is an exemplification of the law of Christian charity. That's roughly the exact words in paragraph two of page 505 of that volume of the New Hampshire reports, meaning the decisions of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And since then, it's gone out of whack. I mean, years ago, it was the, the SWEP was, I think, $5 per thousand. Now it's down to $2, I think. And I, I've been around to the Andrew Zelensky Tobin, uh, John Tobin information sessions. I think there are three of them, Concord, Rochester, and uh, Wolfboro. And what I'm getting at is I ask that it be put on the agenda that you talk about the conduct of Ketukuk Valley, which Michael Kennedy, the attorney in Manchester, is handling for the districts down in the Keene area, not districts, SAUs. And finally, I guess the Claremont case that started it all did join up. So I don't know, there's probably five or six of them. And the bottom line is, well, let me, let me go back to another case, the Londonderry case, 2006. You read on page nine of 19, of that, on the internet version, there's a V in the middle of the page, right above it. It says, uh, no downshift. The, the D, DRA, well, let me back up. You, you all, the towns vote, they say, well, we want this amount of money. It's operating the school. Then you as the SAU, you have, you have an MS-22 form that you send through the portal to the DRA, Department of Revenue Administration, and they then give a tax rate to you. That's under the old statute. It says once the tax rate goes to the board of selectmen, they shall send that over to the tax collector to bill and collect. Then there was another statute that says you may do that. It's enabling legislation. It's, a, it's your choice whether you want to do it or not. But the Constitution, Article 5, Part 2, says that tax rates and taxes are supposed to be reasonable and proportional. And that's the bottom line. There's no more, supposed to be no more uh, rich town, poor town, and the state is supposed to be supplying all this money. And just my own personal opinion, if there's three quarters of the tax goes to the uh, school, uh, if everybody's come down, residential and business, the solution is businesses pay 7.7%, business profits tax. I, I said, just go up on that tax to equal or approach what they're paying now. And you give that statewide tax a true uh, uh, way to go to the state, not just be kept at the uh, town. You know, like Newington. I mean, they have all that, uh, that's one example that uh, Gorski gave. So, since this, uh, the first email that I sent to, to the SAU 79 was to John Fawcett, the new And that was January of 19, that's right. 2019, January 2019, John Foster. And then I, I, Adam knows, he, he gets all these emails. I, I, when, when somebody sent emails the other, just a few minutes ago, uh, the only two that I got is comments at the SAU 73 and then the SAU 73. I don't have two, I don't have, their, their website is better than yours, I think, to that degree, because you can individually write to either of them, any of them. Uh, these other people, I guess, uh, Go, has to go through channels to get to somebody. And uh, I have been to their meeting a few times, and I tried to get that on the agenda, it just wouldn't go. They, they wouldn't talk about it. So there's an Article 8 of the New Hampshire Constitution that was in 2018, I guess it became effective in 2019, and there's only been one case where that has been tried out. That was when the uh, House sued the governor. And then the, that was on the federal fines. It, it says in Article 8, 
a, a resident of the town where they reside being eligible to vote, they don't have to be a registered voter, just of age. Those three categories, if those exist, they can sue in the court that for the town or municipal subdivision, like your subdivision, the SAU, that to, to do things right. And what I'm saying is, I, I was at the board of selectmen meeting last night in Gilberton, I said, the article eight says you can sue on, on who approves it, or who spends it. And when this money is being accumulated from everybody's property tax, that approval that they give to the town treasurer to send a check over to you, that's where I told them, no, do not send any more, have them, do not feed the beast, you're the beast. You are barking up the wrong tree, you gotta tell the state to give you the money. $9,929.00, that would be two bills in 2019. I yelled, but that's just the adequacy amount. I mean, the actual is twice that. They're working on it, down the team, on the actual amount. So that's number one. Then number two is when you get the money, once you spend it, spent, past tense, that's when a citizen can come forward and say, no, that was ill-gotten gains, and if, if, to stop it, they can sue. So I, I'm telling the, the SAU of the Gilmerton that uh, if they ever get that next check, that, uh, you know, they're gonna see me, uh, they're gonna have to see me in court. And, and one last thing is uh, trying to get this information, you know, the payment schedule. I, uh, Chris Hayes did an excellent job. You know, when I, in the old building at the Four Corners in Gilmerton, I'd walk in, knock on the door, I'd walk in, you know, the dog would be there for somebody. I guess it was Rachel had the dog. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I would ask questions because I didn't know about the payment schedule. I mean, who knows on a right to know what to actually ask for what type of document? I mean, you have a little chit chat with the people. And that's what I had with her. And I finally got one. She would send me one, and I'm still waiting for the for the last one. So that's my right to know. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm becoming emotional. 
Okay, final thing. So, my question that's rhetorical is, how are you going to reconcile these lies to children like her, okay? See that face? That's what's going on. You weren't wearing masks at the budget committee, but you're wearing them now. Why? And why is this MOA that you want to use to block our attempts to free our kids from being muzzled every day? These are lies. This is a lie, and I want to know how you're going to reconcile that. We elected you.
here and after the term teacher would refer to any employee, including the current collective bargaining agreement between the board and the GEA. So that, that was specific to 
the CBA, which is school kids, not us at this meeting. But that's, so that, fair. that's fair, but I also yeah. feel I'm expecting my kid to come into the classroom and, and my nieces and nephews who all are in these schools. I don't make these decisions, and I don't think anyone sitting at the table, we all have skin in this game. I, I just feel like I'm trying to lead by example, given the fact hey, that. That's I, a fair point, yeah. and, and you know, that's, that's obviously your, your, uh, your decision to make. Yeah. But it was always my understanding that that MOA never applied to us. It only applied as far as the CBA was concerned. So that's why I'm not wearing one now because I don't wear one anywhere where I go now. So it, it just not that it even matters, but I just wanted to throw and, that out. And trust me, I I think we we went through the the hoops. I think this, um, as I think Kirk will bring up in as he moves forward, um, this expires all of our summer programming, all of that stuff. The plan is to. As this this MOA expires, so too does our mask mandate. It's um, I've been pushing the idea, I've been bugging him all day. So this is not something that we necessarily want to do, but at the same time recognizing that through this process we've tried to be pragmatic, meet the needs of a lot of students. Another thing that came up today from a parent who had reached out to me as well was that they have a type one diabetic student and they sent their student to school. She was thrilled that her her student had their second COVID shot today is because they got it as soon as they were allowed to. Um, and she felt very confident sending that child to school this semester because um, her child was able to have, um, she was assured that, that there would be masking within the schools, but she's very confident moving forward two weeks out of her COVID shot that um, that student does not, is, she's okay without masking. And so I'm also trying to listen to those, those parents in this situation as well who sent their kids to school expecting this mask mandate to be in effect through the school year. So, um, all that to be said, does anyone want to make a motion? Do, do, we, do we need to make a motion to go forward with the GE to um, say, hey, tomorrow, can we get a you know roll call vote ASAP and potentially make something happen before the end of the school year? I mean, that, I, I, I would be happy to make that motion. It's just going to get harder. Um, I, we're still, as Nib so pointed out, we've kind there? of gotten off of public comment, Absolutely. so okay. let's listen to public comment and then I'll close that. Fair enough. Is it the sense of the school board that a child coming to school involved in an act of civil disobedience by not wearing a mask would be left alone? Thank you. Thank you. All right, is, is oh, Danielle. <laughs> Danielle Walter, um, Cherry Valley Road from Gilbert. Thank you to the board, teachers, and administrators who make this lecture that work very hard to keep our children in the school this year. Last year, my child struggled tremendously with remote learning, and I was grateful to have the school open full time and extended it. I was even happier that throughout the year, we didn't make drastic decisions to close after the holidays and start that trend of closures. I do support unmasking our children in Gilbert schools. These past couple days, my son has come home tired, bright red in the face, and does not understand why he can go to a local grocery for strangers without a mask, but has to wear one around children he sees every day. I grew up in Guilford. I love this community. I love everything it has to offer, but let's take a step into normalcy and give the parents back their freedom to make the choice to, to mask their children. I understand the parents that are sending their child to school with type one diabetes, but that child does have the option to wear a mask. Um, our children should not have to.
Any discussion? Oh, so it's seconded by Audra. Any discussion regarding that? Um, the only thing I want to, because of how it's listed um, in there, as far as like the, the physical activities and stuff, I just want to. Can we reach out to the teachers and make sure that they understand? Because it's my understanding also that that was not the expectation that they're exerting themselves, that they can have those breaks, math and stuff. I don't want kids passing out in the middle of the field. Um, let's make sure that that's. Oh, sorry. I love what you're saying. <laughs> sorry. Um, I want to make sure that the teachers are adhering to this memorandum as far as like their physical exertions and things like that if they are outside to make yes and they um, their spacing that they shouldn't be wearing that and let's make sure that the teachers are actually doing that and well, likewise and maybe it. and maybe just re follow up to see if there's anything else within that that is not being followed because right. i was not aware of that either all right i'll call for a vote um, regarding the motion on the table all those in favor Oh, she was 
yeah, so it's really two against. So I'm looking at uh, Article Number Six only, right? When I read uh, correct, yeah, paragraph six. Paragraph six. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you. submitted 
and RGK going through the privacy because it seems like you are you have the power to give a minor child a new life that is not enumerated anywhere. So I am questioning that, and that's when I got the turn from Superintendent uh, Whitehead that basically said nothing at all here. I dropped the papers into the air because he had decided to give me a new name. And none of that paperwork answered my specific question. So let me repeat. Are we going to play this game all over again? Neither of the two documents attached that Viper sent in response to my most recently submitted right to no demand answered my actual question. Throwing answers from someone else's right to no demand that don't pertain to mine is both insulting and starting yet another pattern of not acting according to the law. Avoidance of direct questions, throwing non-responsive verbiage as if it was chat, is both unacceptable and a display of slothfulness all thus the display of disrespect. It does not reflect well on the board having delegated this work to your subordinate. So I ask that my right to know be resubmitted and taken under uh, review. I have not yet had a return from that. And I asked that question back in May, on May 11th. The five business days, according to RSA 91, it had well passed. So my question would be, and this would be something I, you probably would take up on your own, but when am I going to get a response? Again, the board is not following the law. The actual part is lying to parents as far as privacy is concerned. Transgender and gender nonconforming students have the right, again, do you have the power to grant a right? I would maintain that you don't because you're, we are a billing rule state. To discuss and express their gender identity and expression openly and to decide when and with whom and how much to share private information. The contact, and this is the part that you just cannot accept a new policy from the New Hampshire School Board Association and automatically assume, oh, this has been legally clear. Because as is with Section C, it wasn't, and it's not. It is unconstitutional, and I'm very happy that you guys changed it. I really am. When contacting the parent or guardian of a transgender or non-conforming student, school personnel should use the student's legal name and pronoun corresponding to the student's gender assigned at birth. Yeah, assigned at birth. You don't assign somebody sex at birth. It's derived from conception. I would appreciate using the right verb in that. But still, what goes on is that you are with, you are basically lying to parents, either by commission, by deliberate action, or omission, by refusing to act at all. I would maintain that this is being contested in the courts, in fact, it already is, as illegal. My right to know was asking. Where does this school board derive the power to lie to parents? The answer, if there is such, would simply be to merely point to that New Hampshire RSA that says, yes, you can do that. The flip side of this is that you cannot do it because you cannot show anyone what legislative action, what RSA gives you that power. Therefore, by that dint, you cannot do this part of the privacy bill. So I am going to ask that my RTK be reinstated and that you show that you have the power to give a new right to a minor child and not keep the parents in the loop. I understand that schools are in part in local parentis but to cut them out of the loop as if they are guilty of something already, where that minor child is going through a traumatic time in their life, to automatically assume that parents are guilty, that's beyond pale. So I expect that within five business days, I will have an answer to my question. Now somebody brought up the email. 
I filed that right to know for the email log from the district because Superintendent Kirk said there, was, there has been no communication whatsoever. I find that extremely hard and difficult to believe. So, if you've ended up with 250,000 uh, responsive records after I stated, restated my original right to know, this is what I'm looking for, and then stated, here's the way to go about doing it, and nobody called me to ask, hey, Skip, this is getting a little out of bounds. Can you help us out here? I would have been glad to have done it, but nobody wants. Now the question is, who's at fault for that? Yes, please. Well, I, I'd just like to make some mention to that because I have had conversations with other board members as well as uh, Superintendent Weitler about this issue. Um, I thought I remember in our last um, correspondence that went out that we had responded to him, that we had told him you had been, you had gotten a response. Maybe not the answers you were looking for, but you did get a response from the district. I got an email with two PDFs one of which was addressed to a Mr. Shea, and I went through- No, 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 the second one. This is, unless I'm miscrossing things. The second here. one being? Being the email that you requested. I thought I heard a word. Okay, so maybe I misinterpreted. I thought I, I read in one of our- I've been working on it, but this okay. is the first time I have heard somebody, I, Gretchen, I don't know what the word is, you or Jeanine, somebody said 250,000 records. That's the first I've heard of this. I, I'm confident that Mr. Beitler sent you an email letting you know that we're working on that right to know request, correct? I got the working on it part, but not the, oh my gosh, what is this doing? You could have asked me to say, look, is this really what you want? And I, at 250,000 records, that's nuts. The filter, just, just on a statistical basis, I don't think you would have been able to come across with more than two to three percent of being responsive records to what I was looking for. Given the intent of the original R2K, which I asked, because I didn't get an answer, to resubmit. And the email log request was due to that non-responsive reply that I got from Superintendent Now, Mr. Now, Brenda runs a tight ship. She is a treasure to this district. I would be happy to talk with her. So as she goes through the Office 365 stuff again, or to be able to pare down the interim stuff that she's got now, I'd be happy to do that. Like I've said before, I'm semi-retired. I got, I don't have anything better to do. I can do this. But, you know, if you sent me 250,000, fine, I'll stuff it on my server, and, I'll go through it myself, but it's kind of nuts if you guys are still rolling through and getting real records. But it really comes down to, with all of that being secondary or tertiary, the important part is when you see these policies being rolled out, you need to ask as board members, don't depend on, on the staff, take your legal counsel with several grains of, of salt, but look at this policy and say, more than that. How could this go wrong? What is going on with respect to the legal authority that the board has? And you folks already said, you can't spend all this money on the lingo. You don't have the legal authority to do that. When it comes to your policy, the same thing happens. You can only do what the subdivision of the state is allowed to do by authorizing legislation. That's basic civics. This is not a secret. If you look at the policies and go, does this violate the Constitution? Does this violate legislation? You can't do it. So why plow ahead? Any questions of me about this one? No questions from us. Thank you for your input once again. Thank you. Just wanted to know that uh, if anybody has their windows down, I don't know if you're paying attention, but it is pouring. Is that rain pouring? Yeah. I, I have no people there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, those are so, so perhaps. So I just wanted to say thank you. I probably
probably go back to today, remember, because everyone will come through these things. And uh, I think as president, you're supposed to come through a couple more. So it's nice to be back next year. And I just want to thank you guys. I know some of you had sleepless nights, and it was a really crappy year, and you guys kicked butt. So I'm very glad you had to be okay now. Um, but I just wanted to make a recommendation for next year. Um, my daughter, my son had two or three quarantines this year, and my daughter had three. So not a big deal, totally get the quarantine thing, 100% on board with it. Um, the only recommendation I have is most of the time it was great. If the entire cohort or the entire class was in quarantine, it was wonderful. The teacher was right there. All was well. You know, they had the Google Meets and they had their assignments and they talked to the teacher and there was all kinds of communication. The problem was when my son tested positive and we all ended up getting it, but our tests claimed that myself and my husband and my daughter didn't get it. That put my daughter in a 20 day quarantine. That was nine instructional days in this. Would have been 14, luckily or unluckily for us. It was during April vacation. So she did, um, she already missed those five days. The problem was she emailed out her teachers. I'm the mom at home going, email your teachers, email your teachers. I know not every mom is like that. Um, we got responses, oh, I hope you feel better. I hope you don't get it, all the great things. Match got wonderful assignments. Um, a lot of her other teachers, she's a fifth grader. Um, a lot of her other teachers I got, or she got, um, checked the website. Fantastic, but it wasn't updated. So my daughter spent the nine days of her instructional time. She probably had half hour, 45 minutes worth of work, and she missed all of that schoolwork. Now my daughter's a great student, top of her whatever. She's not a slacker kid. She's not, she loves learning. She was mad at me for dismissing her yesterday. So um, I just, my recommendation for the district is when you're doing your staffing and planning for next year, my understanding is that there is no remote next year, which is great. Um, but maybe having a liaison or one staff member who, when it's not the whole cohort and there's one kid in eighth grade and there's one fifth grader, they're not all gonna have parents like me who are like, did you call them, did you call them, did you have them? So maybe having one person who they could reach out to who could be the liaison between all the teachers because some of their assignments were get the word of the day. Well, it was written on the board. That's super helpful. She wasn't there for 14 days. So um, that's just my recommendation. I know you don't need to hire all the remote teachers, but maybe hiring one remote person or liaison or something to that for the all the districts i mean or all the schools i don't know how you work it out but that was my only recommendation so thank you all thank you any other public comment
works full time as well. Um, everyone really does their very best to be as transparent and responsive as we can. We're not perfect. And I think um, the passion that people bring to these meetings is important and we respect it and are happy to have it. But also we hope just like we try and offer all of you that you offer us some grace in moments that we might not have hit it out of the park because we are just doing our best. And so I think as you hear when we get some of these public comments, when we when we deal with each other with assuming a little good faith in one another, one another, I think it goes a long way and it, it helps us to wanna do better and be more responsive um, when we're we kind of treat each other with mutual respect. So Rock TV.